Hi there, my name is Ewan Nicholson. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Remembering Love. The subject of today's video is grief. And today, it's gonna to be a mixture of you know sharing some personal things about my own story of grief, my own healing process, ongoing healing process with grief, as well as I'd like to share some insights that may apply to you and, and support you in your own journey. So begin with, I'd like to just share with you you know, what I've been through from a grieving process and what I've understood from it and why I think it is really necessary and grief has a tremendous value, a lot more than I think we, we give it credit for. Not just as a thing that we endure and get to the other side of, but as an ongoing, unfolding process. And when we talk about grief, you know, what we're really talking about is, is loss and the sorrow and sadness that comes from loss and often that loss is related to the death of someone we've been close to or someone that we've known and to some degree the depth of our grief is is usually equal to the depth of attachment and love we have for that person but there are different types of grief and there are different things we can grieve over and the death of someone is you might say the most obvious but as I'll go into in the video there are there are other more subtle and abstract things that I think are important to kind of understand and grieve on as well. So let me share you with you a little bit about my own story, about my own kind of grieving process. 20 years ago, this, this, this year, 2020, in the year 2000, my older brother, who two years older, Gavin, uh, committed suicide. So he was struggling for a long time with schizophrenia and it accumulated in a whole series of things to the point where he, he killed himself. Uh, I was in a house, I was sharing with some friends. I got a phone call from my mum, basically saying, Gavin's dead. The police were there, so I drove over, the police were there, and that's when it all sort of came crashing down. The next day, me and my brother had to identify his body, and there was still a part of me kind of, I don't know, secretly hoping that it wasn't real and that they'd pulled back the sheet and it was someone else, but they pulled back the sheet and it wasn't. It was probably at that point when I saw his face and it wasn't like the movies where I pulled the, the thing out of a drawer that was in a separate room with a glass thing and I just someone lifted a sheet over and yeah that was him he was dead um, and yeah it was a really difficult difficult time uh, for a number of different reasons one for the, just the basic thing that I love my brother I cared about him and just the loss of just his absence left this huge hole and at the time, I really didn't, I think, understand the full extent of that pain. And so from a grieving point of view, you know, I kind of thought I'd grieved in the sense of I cried and I got drunk and I cried some more. And, you know, the first year in particular, I cried a lot. But generally, I was crying when I was drinking. You know, it was almost like the, the emotions would come out. And after that time, after he died, you know, my drinking became a lot heavier. You know, retrospectively, I can look back and see the link between the two, but probably at the time, um, I didn't. And I think I drunk on that grief, and although I cried and got morose, I never really grieved. And it got to a point where I was able to just push the pain of that loss further and further down, and would come out in these kind of distorted ways, but in terms of really being with that pain, you know, I just was never really sober long enough to really allow the full extent of that pain to come to the surface. So I got on with things, I got on with my life, and I felt this was something that I just had to get over. And I think it's a very culturally supported message when it comes to grieving, that you have these stages of grief that you have to kind of go through. And the whole idea is, you know, working your way through these, these stages. And, you know, not that I did that, but the idea was at least that you know there was this loss and I had to get on with things because you know the wheel keeps turning life keeps moving and you just have to kind of get on with things and I did but I kind of didn't and I think this is the nature of unresolved grief there's on one level you think well I'm just getting on with things but it follows you as this kind of very subtle shadow very subtle sadness and very subtle sorrow that just accompanies you wherever you go and Probably a big turning point in my grieving process is where I stopped drinking, I stopped taking drugs, I got sober, and then a lot of it came to the surface, you know, a lot of the full extent, and this is like 
14 years, you know, six years ago. So he'd been dead 14 years. And you think 14 years is a long time. You know, you kind of, you know, who still grieves after 14 years? But I think because I hadn't really come to grips with it, I hadn't really let the full extent of that pain and sorrow really come to my consciousness, um, it was an easy thing to do on one level, to just put it aside. So when I did stop drinking, and I did stop taking drugs, and I got sober, you know, it was, it was very painful. It was very, very painful. And, but I really felt it. I really felt for the first time in 14 years, I allowed myself to feel that pain. I allowed myself to feel this ache in my heart, like this deep, deep ache of loss. That he was my brother, who I loved and, and deeply cared for and deeply was deeply attached to. And he had died and he not just died, he killed himself. He died in this self-hating, unaffirming way that I understood and I, I, I got it. I never judged him for it. But he, you know, he died in, really dis, in, in despair, really. So it was not just his death, but the way he died and all the pain that led up to his death and all the trauma that brought him to that point and my awareness of how intermeshed and connected his trauma was with mine and I took one path and he took another and you know when I really allowed the fullness of that sorrow and agony really like a soul agony to come forward it was very very painful you know and I wept in a way that you know I wailed you know I didn't just cry I just broke down at certain points and it just rose up in me like this tidal wave of, of pain and but at the same time as I allowed it to arise as I allowed the fullness of that that pain to surface it felt very healing it felt very um, not even cathartic it felt real it felt there was a realness to that feeling that both connected me to him connected me more to myself and it felt like it sort of burnt through this numbness that I'd, I'd carried for a long time and what happened in the grieving of his death you know my brother's death my brother's suicide it also opened this door for deeper levels of grieving and deeper levels of acknowledgement of loss and as I started to kind of you know go through that grieving process regarding his death, your other losses started to arise within me or an awareness of other losses I'd endured, um, such as the loss of our innocence, you know, me and my brother's innocence, you know, in the th terms of what happened to us growing up and the brutality of it and various things that occurred that there were points in our childhood where that innocence just went, just was taken away. And I was able to feel the loss of that. I was able to to grieve that as a phenomena, as a, a thing that happened, that I was here and then that was taken away and I, that was a loss as well that I could grieve. And I also understood that as I grieved that, I came to understand that when he died, there was, it wasn't just his death, but there was a death of a certain kind of optimism that I had because all during his schizophrenia and his mental illness and the psych wards and just everything that happened that all accumulated over eight years in his eventual suicide, I always had this prevailing belief or this idea that we would overcome it, you know, that if I tried hard enough and loved him enough and, and worked really hard that he would eventually get better and we would kind of get out of this nightmare together. And I really believed in that and I, I felt invested in that and I believed in the power of my belief and the power of my love and all those kind of things. And when he died, I just, like, I just felt this despair. Like, it's all bullshit, really, that, you know, you can love someone and, and bad things happen, you know, and there's nothing you can do about it. And at that point, I think, you know, there's a certain cynicism that was born, you know, a certain feeling that of hopelessness that arose at that point so this kind of like optimism and you know it, we will prevail kind of feeling got replaced with a sense of what's the point what's the point with this what's the point with myself and you know i can see that as that cynicism arose 
um, create a framework for me to drink heavily and all sorts of things. So in the process of really uncovering and allowing myself to grieve my brother's death, all these other losses arose and and they still keep arising, not necessarily to the same extent or the same severity, but I think there's this process of acknowledging our sorrow and pain that is antithetical to the world we live in because we're in a, a certain kind of culture and economy that demands we get on with things. It demands we put our pain aside and we remain functioning working units to make the economy keep moving. And then to make the economy moving, we have to purchase objects, substances to suppress that pain, to, to, to hide that pain, to distract from that pain, so we can work to then produce those objects or produce those f that f services and goods. And it's this terrible vicious circle that at its heart is in denial of our humanity, it's in denial of our realness and authenticity. And I think even if you haven't experience a deep loss of someone close to you, and many people have, I think there's a, there's a cultural grief that we're all affected by, which is there's a loss of something we're not even conscious of. And as indigenous cultures have been all but wiped out over the last few hundred years, we've lost something in that process, a loss of sacredness, a loss of connection, a loss of our relationship with nature and community, we become alienated, disconnected, and we're desperately looking for solutions in substances, in, in distractions, in, in devices, to, to try assuage that deep pain of loss, of grief. And I think a lot of us aren't even aware of it. We're not even aware that's what's really going on. And we now have a sudden kind of homogenized culture around the world where capitalism and our economic model has kind of captured the whole globe. Everyone's either in it or trying to become it. And in that process, something has been lost. And it's evident in the, the, the epidemic of addiction, substance abuse, uh, distraction, alienation, loneliness, sickness. To me, they're all symptoms of a deeper loss that isn't really acknowledged and I can't afford to be acknowledged because if everyone just if we took away television legal and illegal drugs drink cigarettes alcohol coffee and just took them all away from everyone for a few months the whole world would collapse I think I don't think people would be able to handle the pain that would arise so I think grief is with us you know whether we're conscious of it or not and you know if you've if you got to this point in the video, I invite you to acknowledge and share your your pain and suffering. We're in because it's not easy, you know. Because there's there's this focus on being happy and moving forward and getting through and enduring and conquering this kind of hyper masculine uh, sort of dominate and get on top type sort of ethos and culture that we're in. You know, one, to keep society functioning, and two, to deny our own pain. And it takes a certain degree of courage and vulnerability to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not over it. You know, I'm suffering. You know, I feel immense agony inside of my heart based on the losses I've incurred. And you know, that's okay. And I'm entitled to share that and express that. And part of this video itself is just an act of that, an act of whether 10 people watch it or one person watches it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just the act of sharing what's inside our hearts, being vulnerable, being open, and being true to all our beauty and all our sorrow, because it's all part of our humanity. It's all has value. And you know, I'm just really making this video today to kind of put that out there and share my story and I encourage you to do the same because our losses, our grief matters. It's part of who we are. It's part of our story. And you know, what you feel matters. You know, your pain matters. And it's worth sharing. And you know, I think it's an important revolutionary act to share our sorrow and to express our pain and to be true to all of what's in us. You know, the, the painful parts, the agonizing parts, the beauty, the joy, all of it, all the rich tapestry of 
what makes us human. So thank you for listening and take care of yourself. Bye-bye.